2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm, I know we read this, but we'll go through it. I, I want to begin by just reading the first five verses, okay? You got the chapter, 2 Corinthians 9. Listen again. He says, for as touching the ministering to the saints, ministering to the saints, he's, talk, he's talking about the special offering that he's taking up for the needy believers in the church in Jerusalem. It's superfluous for me to write unto you. I don't really need to write. You, you know what this is about. For I know the forwardness of your mind. I know how eager you are to give to this need for which I've been boasting of you to the churches in Macedonia, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. I've been boasting about your willingness, your eagerness to give to this special offering. And it has really promoted a giving spirit among the Macedonian churches and uh, the churches in northern Greece and Achaia. This you were ready a year ago, he says. And your zeal hath provoked very many. Your desire to give a year ago was used of God to stir up a giving spirit in these other churches in these other areas. Yet, verse 3, have I sent the brethren, I've sent my representatives, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, you, I, I'm giving you a heads up. You need to be ready with this offering that you were so eager to give. Verse 4, lest if they of Macedonia, I'm sending brethren from the churches of Macedonia that I've been proud to encourage them, boasting of how eager you are to give. They're going to come for your offering, and so you better be ready with it, because if they find you unprepared, verse 4, you're going to be ashamed, not to mention myself. and You're going to be embarrassed, and so am I. Verse 5, therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, wherefore you have noticed before the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. <laughs> Can I boil this down to one sentence? What he's saying here, when it comes to finances, as in all aspects of Christian ministry, everything is to be done decently and in order. Not haphazard, not unprepared. And so he's giving them plenty of heads up so that when these representatives come for the collection of this special offering, everything will be ready. They'll be ready for it. I want to begin talking again from the Bible and what the Bible says about believers and their giving by reminding you that in these two chapters, it's all about giving, but Paul doesn't use the word money a single time, which is interesting, but they know what he was talking about. They know he's talking about money, but here's what I want to say. This is the basis for everything that I believe chapter eight and nine teaches about believers giving to the Lord. Are you with me, guys? I want you to hang in here. I believe that this is perhaps the most important part of what I have to say, and it's this. That real Christian giving is not simply mere human beings deciding what they're going to give. It's not just a human decision, and it's not just human provision. Real Christian giving is something that is prompted by God and something that is provided by God. It is giving that is produced in our hearts by the enabling power of the Holy Spirit of God. It's called grace. Grace is God giving us the ability to do things that otherwise we would not be able to do. Grace is God's supernatural ability in our human inability. And this is called grace giving. It's giving that is based upon the enabling grace of God. Otherwise, we don't do it. It's the Holy Spirit of God that prompts this kind of giving. The Holy Spirit lays a specific amount on the heart of the person that walks with God. On the heart of the person that looks to God for uh, his leading 
and looks to the Lord for his provision for the precise amount that he lays on the believer's heart, for God to provide that amount in the way that he chooses. It could be through just regular income that comes as a result of your, your job earnings. It could be that it's supplied through different types of savings that we have, or maybe some special sources that uh, this income uh, arrives into our possession. Or maybe it's sometimes unexpected monies that we had no idea we were going to come into that God arranges. When God lays an amount on your heart, you can trust that if you will look to him, he'll provide that amount as well. And this is what grace giving is. And this is, of course, a special offering. But I think the truth and the principles of grace giving apply to all weekly offerings and giving to the Lord. And so I want to emphasize the fact that this kind of giving is really, listen to me, it's the opposite of what we call tithing. Tithing does not really require any real connection with the Holy Spirit. You can do tithing simply by being humanly disciplined and having willpower. God desires believers to develop a deeper, a closer fellowship with him. So even your giving is connected to and tied to your fellowship with Jesus. And that kind of giving, it makes life a blessing because it challenges you to stay in close contact with God so that you can sense his leading and so that you can always trust his provision for what he leads you to give. And in this passage, grace giving is, God, is really spiritually enriching it's spiritually enriching to give this way, not only to you, the giver, but also to the people that are the recipients of uh, the gifts that are given to God's work. So that's the basis of what I want to talk to you about this morning from this ninth chapter on giving. Giving is a supernatural thing. It's not merely a human thing. It's a supernatural thing that God, God wants to... He wants to lay a specific amount on our hearts, and he wants, to, he wants to show you how he can supply that through us. If we'll just be those channels of blessing, if we'll just be uh, the conduit through which he works. So let's pause a moment and pray and ask God to really speak to our hearts. Lord, we can't do this without you. In fact, as Jesus said to his disciples, you need to... You need to, to, to depend upon me because without me, you can't do anything that is of any spiritual and eternal value. And so, Lord, we don't want to waste people's time today. And so I'm looking to you. I am taking the promise. You said that if I would ask, you would give me the Holy Spirit's enablement. You'd give me the spiritual ability that I don't have. So I, I take and I thank you for undertaking for me. But Lord, these people that are listening, their minds are going to be wandering. They're going to be distracted. They're going to be perhaps distracting one another unless you give them the ability. And I pray they'll ask you for the ability to be concentrating and not be distracted and not mind wandering, but focused upon what it is you have to say. Lord, we're here for you. We love you, and we want to hear from you, and we want you to accomplish your purpose in our hearts and lives. Show us what real giving is about. Let us not uh, be satisfied, perhaps, with the level that we're at. Lord, uh, stretch us and, uh, and just continue to work softness and tenderness and receptivity into our hearts. Let us not think that we know better, but let us rather sit at your feet as it were, and let the Spirit of God be our teacher and show us truth that otherwise we wouldn't. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I said that this kind of giving, grace giving, giving that is supernatural ability that God 
supplies to his people when they depend upon him is spiritually enriching. And in this fifth, this ninth chapter, in those 15 verses, there are four ways in which this grace giving is spiritually enriching. And the first way is in verse 6. Chapter 9, verse 6, and it says this, But this I say, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. Opposite, he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So the first way in which grace giving is spiritually enriching is because it becomes fruitfulness. That's what that sixth verse is about. It's an agricultural illustration, as you know. Uh, and uh, here's the agricultural uh, thought, that what you sow in the springtime, you reap or you harvest in the fall time. You harvest what you plant, and your the, the, the amount of your harvest is determined by the proportion that you plant in the spring. You plant a little bit, your harvest will be a little. You plant a lot, your harvest will be a lot. And you know, that is true in all areas of life. You will reap according to what you sow. However, it's especially true when it comes to giving. And the idea here is planting, not just merely scattering seed, not just merely scattering your money like seed, but sowing it. That, re that reveals a deliberate investment, a deliberate investment that is based upon faith. You know, farmers may not realize it, but farmers are people that their whole life is based on faith. The seed that they plant in the springtime, they have to believe that there's going to be the right uh, weather and uh, nutrients in the soil in order to bring a harvest in the fall. And in the area of giving, when God lays an amount on your heart to give, you have to trust him to provide it and to give the increase. That's the point here. You can be fruitful. The spiritual enrichment is, first of all, in fruitfulness. You know, there's two types of fruitfulness that the Bible talks about. You remember what Paul says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 8? He says, he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So there is a carnal fruit and there is a spiritual fruit when it comes to giving. Let me say that carnal sowing, carnal sowing to the, to the flesh, that is spending money to gratify your personal wants, that's going to reap corruption. That's what he's saying. When we spend our money to gratify our personal wants, it's always going to result in corruption. That's the Bible principle. And it's not just what we give to the Lord and to the Lord's work. It's why we give it that's important to the Lord. Do we give it for personal reasons? Do we give it to uh, gain a good impression of others? Do we give to feel good about ourselves? Or do we, as some of the prosperity uh, preachers say, do we give in order to be blessed, in order that we might get? That's carnal sowing. That's carnal fruitfulness. What we want is spiritual fruitfulness, is what he's referring to in that sixth verse. It's sowing to the Spirit and then reaping spiritual benefit. Grace giving, faith-based giving. Here's what it is. It's listening to the Holy Spirit. Do you know how to listen to the Holy Spirit? Did you know the Holy Spirit is a person and that he speaks? It may not be audibly, but the Holy Spirit is a person and he speaks. That's what Jesus meant when Grant referred to John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and thus they follow me. 
You know how to listen to the Holy Spirit? You know how to listen to his leading? So that you can respond then in your giving and sacrificial love, trusting God to meet your needs and trusting God to meet needs through your giving, the needs of others. As you give generously, you're going to find the more that you give generously, that you'll be moved by God to give more than you personally can spare. But you'll learn to trust God, and the result will be you'll reap life everlasting. Now, don't misunderstand that. That doesn't mean that you work your way to eternal life. It doesn't mean that you gain heaven by your giving, by your good works, by your charity or whatever. What it means is when you sow to the Spirit, when you give as led by the Holy Spirit, trusting God to provide through you and for you, what happens is you lay up treasure in heaven. That's what Jesus called it. You lay up your treasure in heaven where he says moth and rust don't corrupt and where thieves can't break in and steal it. You're laying up treasure. You're making an eternal investment. So be sure that when you spend, it's an eternal investment. It's, again, fruitfulness. But there's a second spiritual enriching thing about grace giving. Not only fruitfulness, but look at verse 7. He says that every man give according as he purposeth in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth what kind of a giver? A cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. Did you know that that word cheerful in our English Bible, in the original language that the New Testament was written in, that that word is the word that we get our English word hilarity from? God loves hilarious givers. God loves givers that when they give to the work of the Lord, it's hilarious to them. It is joyful to them. One of the spiritual enriching aspects of grace giving is that it brings joyfulness to the heart of the giver. Now, notice the word purpose, purposeth. That means that this joyfulness in our giving is the result of us being decisive, purposeful, that we make a determined personal choice to give. That's what uh, Paul says uh, when he talks about that offering in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, as he ends that uh, first letter. He says to them in the second verse, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him. So there is that connection it's a decisive uh, choice, a personal choice that comes as a result of following the leadership of God in your life, comes as a result of listening to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead you in giving if you want him to. He'll urge you to give. He'll prompt you to give. And he'll then enable you to give. And... Uh, so this kind of giving that's decisive that a man, as he says in verse 7, he purposeth in his heart, it's Holy Spirit-induced giving. It's not just human giving. It's not you uh, bowing to human pressure to give, he says, not of necessity. It's not you being coerced by human beings to give. And he says, you shouldn't be giving with reluctancy. You shouldn't be an unwilling giver. Your giving should not be joyless. It should be joyful. It ought to be with hilarity. Frances Ridley Havergal, a songwriter, she wrote a lot of poems that have been put to music. One of the, the, the I think, most famous songs that she wrote is Take My Life and Let It Be. And in the one of the stanzas of that song, listen to what she says. She says, take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. And in her autobiography, she did what she wrote. 
She lived that song in her life. She wrote, take my silver and my gold now means shipping off all my jewelry, including a jewelry cabinet that's fit for uh, a queen to the church's missionary society. She said, I don't think that I've ever packed a box with such pleasure, giving with hilarity. All of her jewelry to the work of the Lord, she says. You see, this kind of spiritual enrichment of joyfulness is the result of being decisive, purpose, purposing in your heart, but also it includes delight. God delights in a hilarious giver, in a cheerful giver. That joyful attitude that sweeps away all human restraints in giving, that overcomes and overwhelms the person, has uncontainable joy in it. Have you ever experienced hilarious giving? I mean, genuine, joyful giving, where it was such a blessing to you to be able to give what you gave because you know God laid it on your heart. God is in this. God led in this. God supplied this. And what a joy to just obey the Lord and trust him and to see him then use it in such a great way in people's lives and the Lord's work. There's a third spiritual enrichment that comes from grace giving, Holy Spirit-led giving, Holy Spirit-enabled giving. That's in verses 8 to 10. Let's look at them. It says, God is able to make all grace. There's the word. By the way, seven times in uh, chapter 8, the word grace appears. And uh, in chapter 9, seven times. Remember, when you see that word grace, always think that's God's supernatural ability. Okay? So he says, God is able to make his supernatural ability abound toward you as far as giving is concerned. That you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Here's the third spiritual enrichment. When we practice grace giving, Holy Spirit led and enabled giving, you'll find that your giving includes usefulness. Not only fruitfulness, not only joyfulness, but usefulness. Grace giving, actually, he says in these three verses, produces a ministry of giving. And here's the idea, folks. Don't miss this. When God can trust you with money, he'll always see that there is sufficient money for yourself and for others. When God can trust you, can I say it this way, with his money? Because 100% of the money that you and I have is really not ours. Because we don't belong to ourselves. We're not our own, which means all that we possess is not our own. It's all his. And so when God can trust you with his money, you'll find that you will always have sufficient for yourself and for the work of the Lord that he would lead you to be a part of in your giving. Usefulness. He quotes in that ninth verse from Psalm 112, verse 9, which, by the way, is about fearing the Lord. And basically, he says in the 112th Psalm, when you fear God, you don't have to fear anyone or anything else. Have you ever arrived there? Where you fear God and thus you completely trust him and you have no other fears. You know what that's like? You know what he's saying there? And uh, so he's saying, you don't have to fear not having enough for yourself as far as money if you give. If you fear God, God's going to take care of you. You can trust him is what he's saying. He's going to see to it that you have enough for yourself and enough to disperse to others also. So I've never seen God as any human being's debtor. 
God is a debtor to no man. And so God enriches youthfulness in our giving, usefulness in our giving, by ensuring, first of all, in verse 10, that he meets our needs. He meets our own needs. The psalmist said it this way, I have been young and now I am old. Neither have I seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. That's perhaps another way of saying God's people don't have to ask others, don't have to beg. Because God, the Heavenly Father, if you look to him, will meet your need. Paul puts it this way in Psalm, uh, in, in Philippians 4.19, Paul says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And so the usefulness of this kind of grace giving, it meets, first of all, your own needs are met, but also in that 10th verse, he multiplies your resources. It, it, through you, he ministers seed to, to the sower, that's you, meets your needs, and then he multiplies your seed sown and increases the fruits of it. That is, he gives more resources besides meeting your own needs. He multiplies it uh, as, a, as a seed planted in the ground, brings forth a lot more than just one seed. You plant one corn seed in the ground and you get uh, a stock of corn with at least two ears on it. And each ear is packed with corn seeds, right? That's the picture here. He multiplies the resources that he gives you. And the Holy Spirit enables you to not be impoverished by giving, but actually enriched by giving. It's like Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. It's an it's a imagery of a container of grain that is filled to the brim and running over the edge. That's how our liberality, our generosity in giving ought to be. And God says, I can see to it that you'll be running over if I can trust you. I heard of an elderly woman, true story, that didn't have any money. And she was too old to work. So she began to pray. She began to pray and ask God to teach her how to get money so that she could give it to missions, so that she could send out missionaries. Before this woman died, she was supporting 95 missionaries. God used her as a channel of blessing, multiplying seed to the sower and then bread to the eater. And, and uh, <clears throat> it motivates, it increases the fruits of your righteousness, your giving. God uses your giving to bless other people and, uh, and to bless the ministries. And the fruits of your righteousness then are multiplied and others are motivated by your giving. You're sowing to the spirit. There's a fourth way in which grace giving enriches people spiritually, both the giver and the receiver. And that's in verses 11 to 15. And you'll find several times in those verses the word thankful or thanksgiving or thanks. Thankfulness. Grace giving, it will produce fruitfulness. It will produce joyfulness. It will produce usefulness and it will produce thankfulness. Here is the ultimate, the, 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 ult, the ultimate motive of spirit-filled grace giving. It turns your giving into an act of worship. You remember when Jesus fed the 5,000? Uh, it says that when he received that little boy's lunch, uh, he lifted up his voice in prayer in thanksgiving to the Lord. 
and then distributed that uh, food to his disciples to distribute to the to the masses to the crowds that were there that's the that's the idea here that the ulti- the ultimate motive of spirit filled giving is that it leads people to worship by giving thanks to god and in fact in verse 11 he says being enriched there's our word being enriched in everything to all bountifulness which causeth through us thanksgiving to god there is nothing more soul satisfying Nothing more fulfilling than a God-given thankfulness from others that is the result of us being a blessing to them by our giving. Perhaps that's what Paul meant when he quoted the words of Jesus in Acts 20, 35. Truly, it is more blessed to give than to receive. There is that soul satisfaction when you hear people thanking God because of what you've given. It's greatly satisfying. It's also church edifying. Look look at verses 12 and 13. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but it is abundant also by the many thanksgivings unto God. While by the experiment of this, this ministry, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal or generous distribution unto them and to all men. These verses reveal how the enrichment of thankfulness in giving teaches the church to praise and pray. They develop a thankful heart, and a thankful heart is the mark of an edified church, of a church that is spiritually being built up. I close in uh, the 15th verse. Here's the last time the word thanks is used in this chapter. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable or indescribable or inexpressible gift. Spiritually enriched through thankfulness that is God magnifying. You know that 15th verse is? It's the climax of the subject of Holy Spirit-enabled grace giving. That is, whenever you give with thanks, it reflects and it reminds us of the inexpressible love of God in unselfishly, not sparing his own beloved son, but giving him as that one and only totally unique, dear, dearly loved son for his human enemies, for those that hated him. That's what the Bible says. Have you ever personally taken advantage of God's indescribable gift? By that I mean, have you trusted God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as your personal savior? That's an inexpressible. You talk about giving. That's the greatest giving. There's the greatest example. of, And all of our giving really uh, climaxes and crescendos to the great gift of God the Father, not protecting and sparing his own son, but crucifying him for us. Yes, it was human hands that wickedly crucified the Lord of glory, but it wouldn't have happened if the Father had not graciously and mercifully given his Son in the behalf of you and I and all who listen and all who will believe that we might be forgiven and have everlasting life. So have you personally taken advantage of that inexpressible, indescribable, unspeakable gift? Are you born again? Are you in a saving relationship with Jesus? Have you received him personally? Have you trusted his his finished work when he took your sin in his body up on that tree and paid for it once and all, once and for all? Have you done that? Have you received that indescribable gift of Jesus as your Savior? If so, and I think many here have, perhaps the majority, I would say, by your own testimony, but if so, then what kind of giving heart 
would that prompt in you and me? What kind of a giving heart would that uh, uh, make us to have? The blind songwriter Fanny Crosby, she wrote a poem that was put to music. And the name of it is, Take the World, But Give Me Jesus. Take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are, are but a name. But his love abides forever through eternal years the same. All the height and depth of mercy, all the length and breadth of love, all the fullness of redemption, pledge of endless life above. She says, take the world, but give me Jesus. In his cross, my trust shall be till with clearer, she's blind, remember, till with clearer, brighter vision, face to face, my Lord, I see. We want to hang on to this world and all that it has to offer, don't we? But our heart ought to be like hers. Lord, what matters and what I want more than anything else that this world has to offer is you. So, Lord, take the world. Just make sure that I get Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Take the world, but give me Jesus. I wonder if that's on the, the honest estimation of your heart this morning as you sit here as you listen is that really your heart what really matters to me is i get jesus because folks if you have jesus he's enough now and forever if you have everything that this world has to offer and you don't have jesus you are eternally bankrupt for what shall it profit? Words of Jesus, not mine. For what shall it profit a person if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Take the world, but give me Jesus. You know what you've been hoarding? You know what you've been holding so tightly onto? You need to change your vision. Take the world, but give me Jesus. You know, as I get older, my wife and I, as, as we age, we realize just how nothing, the things that we thought were important that this world gives, the, the goods, the materialism, the money, all, yeah, you, you need it, I understand, to a certain extent. But it's not all that important. We can live without it. And believe me, we've moved We've moved uh, friends and relatives enough to realize that that stuff, that junk, all that stuff, so much of it is unnecessary. You know, you load it onto the, the moving van and and it gets loaded on the moving van again. Then it gets, you keep moving, it gets loaded again. The same old stuff. And then eventually the person dies. And then that stuff, you know, we found... Our kids don't want it. They're not nostalgic about it like we happen to be. They don't want it. We've saved it. We've moved it a million times for nothing. Take the world, but give me Jesus. Don't get attached to the things of this world. In fact, that can very easily steal your love and your devotion to God. That's why John warns us, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, because it'll steal your love for God. Take the world, but give me Jesus. Let's pray.